as you can see, the title of this sermon is a question. What is love? Let's get this out of the way first. I know <laughs> what many of you are. Baby, don't hurt me. It's So, okay, just let's all process that. Let's lay it to the side. It's an important question. What actually is love? <clears throat> well, the world of biology would major on love as a chemical reaction. Uh, read an article about this last week which described love as the intricate dance between two neuropeptides. <laughs> and it certainly is true that there is a major biological component in feelings of attraction and romance. After all, Elvis wasn't far off when he said, I can't help falling in love with you. Uh, much of those feelings of romantic attraction are impulses that arrive unbidden, of course, under the sovereignty of God. And most people's conception of love revolves around feeling and emotion, romantic feelings of attraction or the strong feelings of affection for a child from a parent and so forth. In our culture, there has been a rise of the declaration simply, love is love. Or in other words, love, love is defined by my personal sexual proclivities and preferences, and no one has the right to tell me how to love or who I can love. I remember one interaction a few years ago with a guy who was talking about his version of spirituality and his take was that because the Bible says God is love, then the reverse is also true, that love is God. That's not correct, by the way. Uh, but it unironically seems that he's not the only one who thinks this way as our culture elevates our subjective and emotional personal truth as preeminent. In all of this, it seems to me that a shallow emotional understanding of love purely has given rise to very shallow views about what we mean when we say that God loves us. <clears throat> so you see statements like, you know, God is just crazy about you. If he had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. You know, that sort of thing. And we do well to understand that the love of God is so much more substantial and significant than that. In our text this morning, Jesus commands us to love one another. And I'm confident that you agree if our Lord has given us this commandment, it's vital to understand and apply what he means when he says for us to love one another. If you've been following along in this series in John, you know, last week we looked at it, that the disciple Judas has left the building. Jesus is still with his disciples in the upper room just hours before he will be betrayed by Judas and arrested unjustly, where Jesus will be condemned to die on a hill called Calvary. But before that happens, over the next several chapters, he has a number of important things to teach his disciples and us. Uh, J.C. Ryle writes about our text. In this passage, we find the Lord Jesus at last alone with his 11 faithful disciples. The traitor, Judas Iscariot, has left the room and gone out to do his wicked deed of darkness. Freed from his company, which, which must needs have been painful, our Lord opens his heart to his little flock more fully than he had ever done before. And here he opens his heart to tell us about how we are to live our lives under his reign and rule. So let's read John chapter 13, starting in verse 31, remembering that this is the inerrant, authoritative, sufficient word of God. <clears throat> Speaking of Judas, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and 
God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. So you see it there in verse 34. Jesus gives us what he describes as a new commandment, to love one another. So the questions that come to mind are, what does that mean? What does this love look like? How is it new? So let's get into the text. I have two points in this sermon to help us navigate through what God intends to communicate through his word. First, we will look at his example of love. And then second, his commandment to love. So first, his example of love. Verse 31. We read again, when he had gone out, Judas had left to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Now, Jesus is with the 11 and says to them, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. What we see again here as we have in other parts of this gospel is that the father and the son are so intimately connected that when Jesus is glorified by the Father, the Father is glorified in the Son. And once again, then, we are, we, are, we are getting a glimpse into the depths of the mysteries of the Trinity. The title note that Jesus uses for himself is the Son of Man. That title, the Son of Man, is a title that describes glory and royalty as described in the book of Daniel, where the Son of Man is given glory and glory and a kingdom, and certainly they would have heard echoes, for instance, of Isaiah 49.3, the prophetic word, and he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. But his glory, his glory that was to be revealed, it would be revealed in a radically counterintuitive way. And Jesus says, now is the time now for this glory to be revealed. God will be glorified in Christ at once. Jesus describes how this is going to happen, but he does so with great affection. He instructs his disciples with great care. Look at verse 33. He addresses them as little children. That was a tender and affectionate way that a teacher would speak to his students, little children. I'm only with you for a little while and then I'm leaving you when you can't come with me. What I must do, Jesus says, I must do alone. And here he is speaking of the crucifixion that he is headed toward in just a matter of hours. Jesus says, when this happens, the glory of God is going to be revealed. He will reveal his glory. It's happening soon, but he will reveal his glory in a most unexpected way. He would be glorified through what the world considers the greatest kind of shame, mocked and ridiculed, blood pouring down his face as thorns pierced his brow, back splayed open as he received lash after lash, crucified on a wooden cross, suspended in agony, naked, laboring, 
to breathe. But even this, this is not what he is saying they could not follow him into. Oh, oh, they could follow him into that part of his suffering, but what they could not follow him into was the suffering that he endured that was unique. For agony was his physical agony, but more in his agony, cosmic were realities were at work. The sinless Savior took upon himself our sins and more received the righteous wrath of God that we deserve for our sin, dying as our substitute. What the world called shame was the glory of God being revealed. He was revealing the glory of God's justice, the glory of God's holiness, the glory of God's mercy, the glory of his grace, revealing the glory of his love for undeserving sinners like you and me. New Testament scholar D.A. Carson says, the supreme moment of divine self-disclosure, the greatest moment of displayed glory was in the shame of the cross. The author of Hebrews says, it was for the joy that he was, that was set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame and raised from the dead, is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God on high. And so the hymn writer says, Thou who was rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake became poor. And this is how the glorious love of God was revealed and displayed for undeserving sinners like you and me. So that all all who turn from sin and self and receive the risen Christ of the cross receive forgiveness of sins and adoption and justification and redemption and eternal life, all unearned, all unmerited, all undeserved, all by his grace. That is the nature of the love of God. That is the example of love and the grounds for his commandment for his disciples to love. See that? Verse 34, look at it. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. Later, he will say in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And Bruce Milne, in his commentary on this text, says, in light of the cross, all other descriptions and definitions of love pale into insignificance. His commandment to love, then, is defined and shaped and informed by his own example of self-giving, sacrificial care and concern, sacrificial serving and prioritizing others, even the most undeserving. And believe it, we are most undeserving. And yet, Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are called, we are commanded to love one another. And we are, we are given an understanding of what that love looks like because we are commanded to love one another just as we have been loved by Christ. So that brings us to the second point, his commandment to love, verse 34. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. Does that make you pause? Make you scratch your head. How is this a new commandment? This surely is not the first time that God commanded his people to love others, and it definitely was not. I mean, go way back into Leviticus, and if you're in your read through the Bible in a year plan, perhaps you are beginning to find yourself shipwrecking on the shoals of Leviticus. But let me encourage you to press on. There are riches in God's word. But we read there in chapter 19, verse 18, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. But Jesus says this is a new commandment. What is new about this commandment to love each other? Well, it is the quality and content of what loving others is supposed to look like. 
So Bruce Milne again says, love is defined by the cross. It is love of that caliber which his disciples are called upon to express towards each other. So our understanding of what it means to love each other is informed by Christ's example of sacrificial love toward us. And love is the preeminent defining virtue of all those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Love is the defining mark of the people of God. And and it is evident, and it is discernible, and it is observable, because Jesus says, all people will know that you are my my disciples if you have love for one another. In other words, our love for each other, observed by a watching world, makes God's love, the invisible God's love, visible to those who observe the church. The love of the invisible God is made visible to the world through our love for one another. Well, Simon Peter doesn't get it, as is so often the case. Lord, where are you going? Well, Jesus says, Simon Peter, you you can't come with me. You can't come with me now, but you will later. And tradition tells us that indeed Peter would eventually die as a martyr crucified like his master. And Peter, in a zealous expression of devotion, declares, I will lay down my life for you, Jesus. The irony is that he will not lay down his life for Jesus. He will betray Jesus as Jesus informs him. No, 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 Peter, listen. You're actually going to deny me. Once again, revealing his divine foreknowledge. And as we've seen again and again, his, his sovereignty over the circumstances surrounding his crucifixion. But the grace of God is knowing this. Jesus will lay down his life for Peter too. And I think here is a caution for each one of us. Even with the best intentions, we are in ourselves very weak. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. There should be a discernible humility functioning in our devotion to Christ, realizing we are always dependent on Christ. And and our greatest declarations of devotion can at times fall flat, so thank God there's grace for that. There's grace for a failure like Peter. And there's grace for us too. In chapter 13, we have two men presented to us who betray their allegiance to Jesus. But the outcome between these two men could not be more different. Judas betrayed Jesus for a little bag of money, and in his regret, we read elsewhere that he hung himself. Peter denied Jesus, but the difference is that he returned to Jesus and received grace to cover over his failure. And if you are not a believer, we're so glad that you joined us this morning. You've been hearing throughout this morning and in this sermon the good news of the crucified Savior of sinners. Listen, if you you today are aware of your sin, and regret for your sin. Go to Jesus with it all. And he will receive you. And he will forgive you. And he will love you. Forever. I pray that you will do that today. All right, some important considerations to think about this command. You may be aware that in the ancient Greek language, there are different words used for love for romantic love, and so forth. The kind of love here is agape love. It is the highest form of love that Jesus commands us to. And understand this, it is love that is only possible through the converting power of the gospel. That's why John, in his first letter, the author of this gospel, informs us we love because he first loved us. Just thinking this week about different so many of us are in this church. I mean, I don't know for those of us who've been going to church your whole life and 
been a part of a church your whole life and conservative in your makeup and you're sitting here listening to a tattooed ex-punk rocker, ex-drug addict, and you're doing so with appreciation and affection. Listen, if, if you had known me pre-conversion, you would not have wanted to be friends with me. And guess what? I wouldn't want to be friends with you. <laughs> My wife and I have often joked about how unlikely our union is in that she never cared much for tall guys, tattooed guys, or guys with a history of drug abuse. And I said, well, I never had a thing for nice little church girls. So here we are. <laughs> that is the effect of the grace of God. It tra transforms our hearts to love one another, even those very different from us. It is in and through his love revealed to us by the gospel that we are able to obey this command. In our conversion, we are given new hearts that are able to and do reflect the love of God in our relationships with one another. And this is love that we take no credit for because it is only by the grace of God in the converting, regenerating power of the gospel that we possess this love. And so John again in 1 John 4 says, Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. When the world sees this love, they see a living illustration of the powerful effect of the love of God revealed in and through the gospel. And so we declare with Paul, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith, 1 Timothy 1.5. I think maybe years ago I told you this story, I'll repeat it. In the effect that my conversion had on the way I thought about other people. Uh, again, my wife and I are very different in this. I'm introverted, largely. And if you're in line with her at the grocery store, you might end up making a new best friend with Kate. Before, before my, my conversion, I accurately fit the pre-converted state described in Scripture, hating one another and being hated. Except for my small group of close friends, I hated people. It was evident. If you had talked to me in line at the grocery store, you would have gotten a scowl and an insult. And that worked its way through all of my relationships. For a period of time, I worked at a power tool repair center. And at one point, I was in the office doing data entry stuff with another woman who, I'm not sure why, there's probably lots of reasons to pick from. She began to dislike me deeply. She started making my life miserable. She started doing things like, you know, she would have a log of any time I made a personal phone call so she could report me to management. I mean, she wanted to get me fired. She hated my guts. And guess what? You hated my guts, I'm going to hate you more. That's how that works. It was a caustic environment in that office. I remember shortly after my conversion, driving into work and having a thought, I don't hate her anymore. In fact, I, I, should, I should show care for this woman. That was not my doing. That, that, that's the effect of the gospel. I began to move toward her in friendship, seeking to be a blessing instead of a curse as we worked together. And, and, and the wonderful thing was, over time, actually a friendship was built. And I was able and had the opportunity to share the gospel with her. That is the fruit and effect of the gospel. And John says in 1 John 4, 
that is evidence that you actually know God. A loveless Christian is an aberration. I mean, there's no such thing, actually. A primary evidence that you actually know God is that you love others. And yet, having said that, yet, we all drift. We fall. We fail. Who among us would declare that we love others too much? D.A. Carson, again, in his commentary says, the new command is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate, profound enough that the most mature believers are repeatedly embarrassed at how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. Can you relate to that? So, with the time remaining, let's try to better comprehend and put into practice this command to love others. And certainly this is appropriate to apply personally if you're married and with your kids, or if you're single and with your friends and your parents, whatever station of life you're in. First, consider this. This love is not merely a feeling of love and affection for others, though we surely have warm feelings of affection for others when we love as Jesus does, but this gets very practical. Christopher Morgan in his book On the Love of God helpfully uh, writes, just as God genuinely seeks the good of others and gives himself for their good, as his people, we too genuinely seek the good of others and give ourselves for their good. That's what love looks like in action because that's what love looks like when it reflects the one who sought our highest good and gave himself for that good. You can say you love people all you want, the proof is in what it looks like. So, reminded of the Broadway musical Fiddler on the Roof and the song, all the encore teenagers are like, I remember doing that a few years ago. The song, Do You Love Me? Between Tevia and Golda, where he says, do you love me? And his wife replies, for 25 years I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned the house, Giving you children, milked your cow. If that's not love, what is? Yes, but do you love me, he says. Do I love him? For 25 years I've lived with him, fought him, starved with him. 25 years my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? He says, then you love me? She replies, I suppose I do. And he says, and I suppose I love you too. In no way am I suggesting that it's healthy to emulate, for instance, the old joke where a wife asks her husband, do you love me? You never tell me that you love me. And he replies, well, I told you on our wedding day, and if it ever changes, I'll let you know. That's a, <laughs> so uh, not purely that. <laughs> Words of affection and love are appropriate and important. But one can hear, one can hear a woman suffering domestic abuse from a husband, making excuses and saying, well, I know he loves me. Does he? So John says in 1 John 3, 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So love looks like commitment and serving and sharing. It's practical. It looks like sacrificing for the good of those we are called to love. But we all understand there are hindrances to this. Let me name a few. One is embracing a kind of orthodoxy without love. You know, one can be a, a courageous warrior for the truth and love sound doctrine. We love sound doctrine in this church. We, we happily give ourselves to the study of doctrine and theology. But one can do that. And one can have all kinds of knowledge about the Bible and about God and about the scriptures and fail to live a life pleasing to God. And so Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and following, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So doctrine's important. Theology matters. We care about that deeply here. We hold to. We are a confessional church. But if we have not love, we have nothing. Another hindrance can be, and this is a very serious one, bitterness. Unforgiveness. Listen, bitterness will take you out. Bitterness left unchecked has all the potential to shipwreck your faith. It is a cliche, but makes sense in that bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. And so Hebrews 12, 15 says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. So if, if you are aware in this moment of bitterness in your heart toward another, do not let yourself be content with that. Do not give yourself to it. It will poison you. It will defile you. Jesus says, if there is an unreconciled relationship, leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled. It's that important. Jesus is essentially saying, just get up from church and go to that person right now and work this thing out. Oh, we must be very careful that we do not give ourselves over to bitterness or that we in unforgiveness represent the unforgiving servant who debt, whose debt was canceled and left that place with joy only to go and to insist and to impress and make someone who owed a much lesser debt to pay up. Another one, this is very common, selfishness. And selfishness is interesting because selfishness likes to hide. Selfishness can hide behind very good things like family time or wisdom in protecting our schedule. Here's, here's, here's a helpful, I think, important diagnostic question to see if we are living in a way that looks like loving the others around us. We look at our calendars. Does my calendar, does my schedule show a priority for people? Typically, that looks like, and I think most understandably, it looks like hospitality. Hospitality is, is opening up your home to love others. Surely, it's reflected in what we give ourselves to when you see needs on realm, for instance. A meal, a help. So grateful for how so many of you do bless and respond to need. But, but if we find ourselves over time, just we don't have time for the needs of others. I have a busy schedule, and I know that we all have very busy schedules. We do well to evaluate. If, 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 you're, a, if you're a dad, if you're a husband, we encourage you to lead your family in this. Perhaps even this week, sit down, look at your calendar with your wife and if age appropriate, your kids and say, does our schedule look like we prioritize people? Does our schedule look like we are all about the business of loving others and serving others? And let me say this as well. To moms in our church with small children because I can almost hear a very busy, exhausted, overwhelmed mom falling under condemnation. <laughs> Just trying to keep your head above water. Time for people doesn't seem like a real thing. <laughs> let, let, me, let me communicate to you. To every busy, overwhelmed, exhausted mom, you have our utmost appreciation and respect. And the work you are doing as you die to yourself each day to love and care for your children is pleasing to God. Oh, d let no one leave here condemned because you've given yourself to the good and godly work of raising a family. 
no condemnation, only commendation. And certainly, last hindrance I'll lay out here is self-righteousness. You know, where we find ourselves in community group or interacting with a friend and we're just thinking to ourselves, you're still dealing with this? I mean, how long has this been? You keep dealing with the same issues? You're not growing? That is a hindrance to love. <laughs> because love looks like Jesus' example with Peter. You know, Peter, again and again, he doesn't get it. He's failing to understand things that even Jesus says clearly. Jesus kindly and gently and lovingly bears with him. I've used this some time ago, but thought it appropriate to bring up again. A equation, you could call it, that author and pastor Ray Ortland provides to help us think about what it looks like to live humbly together in community with all of our challenges and difficulties and besetting sins. Here's the equation. Gospel plus safety plus time. Gospel plus safety plus time. He explains this. Gospel. Good news for bad people through the finished work of Christ on the cross and the endless power of the Holy Spirit Multiple exposures, constant immersion, wave upon wave of grace and truth according to the Bible. Plus, safety. A non-accusing environment. No embarrassing anyone, no cornering anyone, no shaming, but respect and sympathy and listening and understanding so that people can exhale and open up and unburden their souls. A church environment where no one seeking the Lord has anything to fear. And finally, time. Gospel plus safety plus time. No pressure, not even self-imposed pressure. No deadlines on growth. Urgency, but not hurry, because no one changes quickly. A lot of space for complicated people to rethink their lives at a deep level. God is patient. That, That is the kind of environment where love flourishes, where people don't feel like they're your project but they feel your care and your love. Okay. In describing these hindrances, perhaps God is convicting you of a failure to love. And perhaps it's in connection to one of the hindrances to love that I described. If you are experiencing conviction for a lack of love in your life, failures to love, embracing the hindrances I described, hindrances to love, you're feeling conviction of that, that is God kindly alerting you to an area to repent and experience grace. That is not God revealing your sin to you so that you leave here with your head down, endlessly speculating, guilt riddled. No, God shows us sin so that we can turn from that sin and find our Savior there with endless supplies of grace. If you are convicted this morning, let me encourage you. That is God's kindness to you, to turn from your sin and find grace to forgive you and grace to empower you. You turn to the one who loves us with an everlasting love. Let no one leave here endlessly introspective and condemned. Let, let all leave here happily, skipping to our cars, aware of the forgiving and redeeming grace of Jesus Christ for our sin. And finally, we, we remember, we are reminded here that the world is watching us. The world is watching. The love that we have for one another, this kind of self-giving, self-sacrificing love for the good of others. It, it makes a statement. It's, it's a visible apologetic of the gospel. It is the love of God revealed in the gospel made visible for others to see. Now, we must never fall prey to the idea that we should preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. Because the gospel 
The content of the gospel is words that people need to understand if they are to turn to Christ. But, but we are called to adorn the gospel we proclaim with love. Back in the second century, an early church father, Tertullian, once noted that the pagan Romans, as they observed the early church, regularly declared, see how they love one another. And in this world of division and fracture and hostility, what will become increasingly peculiar is a community of believers who through their love communicate the reality of Jesus. We are Jesus disciples. You can see that because his grace is at work in us in the way we love each other. He's real. We're making the real Jesus visible through hearts of love. And certainly coming up next month, we have our bridge course again. Bridge course, this really is an opportunity for people to come and hear teaching of the gospel, but to do so in an environment where there's love and blessing and care. And certainly, oh, my heart is, as we plant Redeeming Grace Church in September, Lord willing, we go there in love proclaiming the gospel. My prayer is that those who observe Redeeming Grace Church, just as those who observe Living Hope Church would declare in bewilderment, see how they love one another. May it ever be so. Let me close with this. Let me give you Paul's definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4, where he says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. To be sure, the only one who has ever perfectly displayed these qualities of love is Jesus Christ. But in him, it is our privilege and our joy to imperfectly, but sincerely, reflect his perfect example of love. Let us hear his commandment to love one another this morning with fresh ears and eagerly respond before a watching world as we invite them in to experience his great love by his grace and for his glory. Amen.